Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar, Sam Rayburn History, Exploring the Rayburn Johnson Dynamic. I am Stacy Flood, Assistant Site Manager for the Sam Rayburn House State Historic Site, one of 34 sites owned and operated by the Texas Historical Commission. Sorry, I was answering your question. I'm Emma Trent, Program Coordinator for the Sam Rayburn Museum, one of four locations of the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History, University of Texas at Austin. Hello, I'm Margo McCutcheon, and I'm the educator interpreter for the Sam Rayburn House State Historic Site. Today's webinar will be a little different than our previous sessions if you've been with us before. We'll be having a panel discussion with questions on the Rayburn Johnson dynamic. Our behind the scenes moderator today is Kim Burpo. She's the site manager at the Sam Rayburn Museum. If you have any questions during the presentation, be sure to type them into the Q&A window, not the chat window. They get kind of lost and muddled in the chat window. So if you put them in the Q&A window, Kim will add them to the end of our presentation. Kim, if you're ready, we can go ahead and get started. The best place to start is at the beginning. How did Rayburn and Johnson meet? Well, Sam Rayburn's relationship with the Johnson family <clears throat> actually started long before Lyndon Johnson won his congressional election in 1936. Rayburn served with Johnson's father, Sam E. Lee Johnson Jr. in the Texas House from 1907 to 1909, which was a little bit before Lyndon Johnson was born. Rayburn and the elder Johnson had different opinions on a number of issues like prohibition and the investigation of Senator Joseph Bailey by the Texas legislature. But when asked, Rayburn said he remembered Sam Johnson Jr. favorably. So Lyndon Johnson already had a connection to Rayburn before arriving in Washington? Yes, uh, Lyndon Johnson actually first met Sam Rayburn in the early 1930s, when Johnson worked as a secretary for Texas Congressman Richard Kleberg. When they met, Johnson was quick to point out that Rayburn had served with his father in the Texas House. Then when Johnson won his own seat in the House, he was determined not only to renew his acquaintance with Rayburn, but to become his protege. As one of the ranking members of the House, Rayburn often met with newly elected congressmen especially those from Texas, but Johnson hoped that the fact that Rayburn and his father had been colleagues would be a stepping stone to developing a closer relationship. Now, it was a bit of a gamble because shortly before Johnson won his election, his father had written to Sam Rayburn, asking him to find a job for Lyndon's sister, Rebecca. When Rayburn's response was noncommittal, then Sam Johnson wrote again, and this time it contained a bit of a veiled threat regarding Rayburn losing some voter support in Texas if he didn't help find Rebecca a job. Rayburn didn't respond to the second letter, and the incident kind of soured his, the good feeling he had toward Sam Johnson. Now, we don't know if Lyndon knew about these letters or not, but he was surely taking a risk to rely on the now tenuous connection between Rayburn and the Johnson family. That being said, Rayburn was eventually won over by Johnson's willingness to do whatever was necessary to be useful. In Johnson, he saw a bit of himself when he first arrived in Washington, young, eager, hardworking, and determined to succeed. Before long, Rayburn began to see Lyndon Johnson's potential as a future leader within the Democratic Party. So Rayburn recognized his potential, but what about the other Democratic leaders? Did they also see Johnson as the future of the party? No, uh, many Democratic Party leaders saw Lyndon Johnson as just another Rayburn protege, no better or no worse than any other. Rayburn though realized that Johnson just needed an opportunity to prove himself. And that opportunity came during the congressional elections of 1940. So House Democrats were losing elections all across the country. 
And they really needed campaign money, but they had no established source of funds. The Democratic National Committee was spending all of their resources on Roosevelt's reelection campaign. And the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which was the fundraising section of the Democratic Party, was poorly managed, understaffed, and was historically unsuccessful at getting contributions that actually made a difference in races. Now, Rayburn was a well-known figure capable of generating contributions, but he was already scheduled to speak at a number of events for these candidates around the country. And also as Speaker of the House, he really needed to be careful about being seen as being too involved in partisan activities such as fundraising. Uh, Johnson, though, was unopposed for re-election, so he didn't need to worry about scheduling any speaking events or raising funds for anything. He had also been looking for a way to get in with the Democratic National Committee, but he kept running into obstacles. So as a final effort, he volunteered to take on the task of fundraising. So Johnson established a makeshift office in Washington, D.C., and he began calling wealthy Democrats around the country to get funds, as well as contacting the candidates themselves to see how many how much money they needed. Uh, so through all this, Johnson managed to raise an unprecedented amount of contributions. Uh, but more importantly, he was also able to see that the candidates received the funds they needed in order to win. Um, and these efforts made it possible to secure the seats that were up for re-election, as well as even gaining new House seats seats in the House for the Democrats. So Johnson's work on this 1940 campaign really validated the trust Rayburn had placed in him, and it earned him that recognition he needed and wanted from other Democratic Party leaders. In letters, Johnson has described Rayburn like a father to him. What kind of relationship did they have outside of the political arena? Well, as Emma said, Johnson had decided he wanted Rayburn to be his mentor, and he worked really hard to make that a reality. Even before he was elected to Congress, Johnson had started to make an impression on Rayburn. So much so, Rayburn agreed to stand beside Johnson at his swearing in when he was first elected as a representative. Johnson often sat, sought out the elder statesman catching the train to Washington or back home to Texas when he knew that Rayburn was going. Eventually, Rayburn began inviting Johnson to his so-called Board of Education, which was kind of like a democratic after hours social club. After the business of the day was concluded, Rayburn would invite friends and select colleagues to join him in a room beneath the speaker's lobby where they would talk politics, map strategy, philosophize, and drink. It was a rare honor for a freshman congressman to be invited to join the conversation and rarer still to be invited a second or third time. Even among experienced representatives, few received regular invitations and even fewer had a standing invitation. And as for the number of key holders to the room, only three people held that honor. All three were Texans. Rayburn himself, of course, his friend and district neighbor, who was Wright Patman, and later his protege, Lyndon Johnson. But of course, all of that could be considered nothing more than a working relationship. It was shortly after his swearing in, however, that Johnson invited his mentor to his DC apartment for one dinner and then another, until soon Rayburn was dining at the Johnsons for dinner or breakfast on a regular basis. Now, Lady Bird charmed Rayburn every bit as much as Lyndon did, if not more. Really, it was her welcoming Rayburn into their home with her warm and affectionate demeanor that brought him back and encouraged him to reciprocate with invitations to his own apartment, dinner out at one of his favorite restaurants, and even visits to his home here in Bonham. Perhaps seeing her as a kindred spirit early on the normally reserved Rayburn began sharing stories of his life in Texas to try to relieve some of her homesickness. He just adored her and called her the darn greatest woman who ever lived, and she reciprocated that sentiment. 
The Johnsons brought Rayburn into their fold as sort of a father figure, like you said, and Rayburn was happy to be part of the family. They, they shared over 25 years of what Lady Bird called a heart full of memories of Mr. Sam. Everything from Lyndon taken to the hospital for an acute case of pneumonia, waking up to find Rayburn at his bedside, to Johnson calling Rayburn first to share the news of their daughter's birth, supposedly before he'd been told his own mother, to countless birthday celebrations, getaways to the ranch, sometimes Rayburn's ranch, sometimes Johnson's. And for his part, Rayburn tolerated a lot from Johnson that no one else could ever get away with. One of the photos you'll see scrolling through our PowerPoint is of Johnson planting a kiss on the top of Rayburn's head, which is something no one else, congressman or otherwise, would have dared to do to the dower speaker. But when Johnson did it, Mr. Sam would just laugh. Historians like to note that although Rayburn and Johnson had a good relationship, the two men were really quite different. Can you tell us a bit about their differences? I think, <clears throat> pardon me, I think their differences really came to light when Johnson was elected Senate Majority Leader because he was able to step out of Rayburn's shadow and into a leadership position of his own. Now, he still visited the Board of Education to have a drink and talk things over, but now he had the congressional power to make his own decisions. And even so, he rarely broke with Rayburn on congressional issues and together they made a formidable team. But in answer to your question, I believe the biggest difference between Rayburn and Johnson was their general view on life and how it shaped their actions. Rayburn was content to take his time to think things through and then act. He arrived in Washington full of ambition, just like Johnson did, but he respected the House's seniority system and realized that it would take time to move up the ladder of party leadership and achieve his goal of becoming Speaker of the House. Now, his journey was quickened along the way by the untimely deaths of some of the men who preceded him, but the point is, is that he was willing to invest the time to get to where he wanted to be. On the other hand, Johnson had this relentless passion to succeed that drove him to work hard, but it also made him impatient for the success he wanted. Rayburn saw Johnson as a man of enormous ability, but privately criticized what he described as Johnson's vaulting ambition. Compared to Rayburn, Johnson was restless and at times seemed nervous or anxious, and his brain was always working on the next step, always figuring out some problem. It was like there was no off button to Lyndon Johnson. Now, <clears throat> another difference is that Rayburn had never been particularly sensitive to criticism. He wanted to know what people said about him, both good and bad, but he looked for the positives hoping that if an article came out in the paper, it was at least more favorable to Rayburn than it was unfavorable. Johnson, on the other hand, was incredibly sensitive to criticism, especially from the press. He would get upset over anything that he felt put him in a negative light. And, and as such, he was usually so defensive when he met the press that he had a wall up and, and he wasn't very, didn't communicate with them very well. And so that just added to his reputation as being aloof and, and uncooperative. Um, Johnson was a big fan of gadgets and he would often boast to Rayburn about some new fangled gizmo that he had acquired. Well, Rayburn preferred simplicity and practically everything in his life. Johnson would ridicule what he thought of as Rayburn being old fashioned from the way that he handled his staff and the, the place that he lived. Well, Johnson could never quite understand Johnson's driving need to have the newest thing. I recall reading a story about how Johnson 
was bragging in the Board of Education room about a new mobile phone he had installed in his car. And Rayburn's response was that he didn't think he ever got a call that was so important, it couldn't wait until he got to wherever he was going. So they just didn't see eye to eye on that. But I think the greatest difference is possibly how each man dealt with opposition. When faced with opposition, Rayburn would listen to their arguments, and counter with his own, relying on his ability to persuade them to come around to his way of thinking. Um, a great example uh, of this is how he managed to get the draft extension passed in 1941. He knew there was a lot of opposition to extending the draft and that he would need significant support from Republican congressmen to offset the opposition of the Democrats that were going to vote against it. And so he spent two days before the House vote seeking out potential supporters and making a personal plea for their support, saying things like, I wish you'd stand by me on this. And his record of being a stickler about ethics and his reputation as an honest man lent credibility to his words. You could believe that he believed every word he said. So if he told you this draft extension was necessary, stand by me, then you could put stock in that. And in the end, the draft re extension resolution passed by a single vote. Now, during his career, Johnson's method of persuasion became famously known as the Johnson treatment. <laughs> it was, it's been described as a mixture of badgering and flattery. He usually had some reminders about past and possible future favors. Johnson liked to utilize his height at six foot four inches to tower over people and, and kind of invading their space and making them uncomfortable to the point that they finally gave in. You've probably seen some pictures that depict Johnson giving someone the Johnson treatment. Rather than persuasion, Johnson pushed people. Some historians have said that he bullied them. But the key to Johnson's success was that he made his communication with them personal. He understood the person he was trying to persuade, and he used that understanding to achieve his goal. Now, in the end, Rayburn and Johnson were the same in their conviction that what they were doing was needed, justified, and right. But they were incredibly different and how they went about getting what they wanted. Those differences sound like they could have a negative effect on the relationship between Rayburn and Johnson, did they? Not really. As we've mentioned, the two of them became almost like family. They had differences that led to occasional arguments, but it was usually because Johnson wanted to take a political step that Rayburn thought he wasn't ready for. So for instance, when Johnson first ran for Senate in 1941, he had 28 opponents, and some of them had strong statewide, statewide support. So Rayburn was afraid that Johnson would be at a disadvantage. And if Johnson lost, if he lost badly, then it could really affect Johnson's chances of ever getting elected to the Senate position again. Uh, so Rayburn advised Johnson to wait for a different opportunity. But Johnson ignored Rayburn's advice. Uh, Johnson thought that his connections in Texas, combined with his very public friendships with President Roosevelt and Rayburn, would swing the election in his favor. Unfortunately for Johnson, both Roosevelt and Rayburn had a, always had a policy of staying out of their own party's elections. So neither of them publicly endorsed him. Now, Rayburn did eventually announce that he had voted for Johnson, but by that point, it was too little too late, and Johnson lost the election. Uh, I'm not sure how much, if any, this election affected their relationship, how much ill will Johnson might have had toward Rayburn for what happened. Uh, but either way, they were still colleagues. They still had work to do in Washington, so they went back to that work. Also, once Johnson requested a leave of absence 
from Congress to become an active duty service member when the U.S. joined World War II in December of 1941. Rayburn sort of let any problems he might have had with Johnson kind of slide away. Uh, another point uh, where the relationship was tested occurred in 1955 and 1956 when Johnson had a heart attack and attempted a presidential run. Uh, so everyone around him had noticed Johnson in an agitated state in 1955 at a congressional Texas delegation luncheon. Uh, Johnson's mind was elsewhere and Rayburn kind of tried to force him to like pay attention to that lunch, even referencing the fact that Congress had existed well before Johnson and would exist well after. Two days after that lunch, Johnson was really considering his chances of becoming a president uh, when he had a heart attack, a heart attack he was willing to ignore until other people called a doctor for him against his wishes. So at this point, Rayburn advised Johnson to take it easy for his health, but Johnson and his ambition wouldn't be halted even for Sam Rayburn. Uh, what could stop Johnson, though, was his own state delegation to the National Democratic Convention. Uh, the Texas delegation had been experiencing serious issues over the last few years, and Governor Alan Shivers had split the delegation even further by 1955 and 1956 with his conservative faction. Rayburn wanted Johnson to take a strong stance against Shivers, but Johnson didn't want to risk alienating a possible ally. Uh, and honestly, although Rayburn thought Johnson's health was too much of a liability to run for president or even vice president, Rayburn supported Johnson to represent the Texas delegation at the National Convention in 1956, which could, in a way, give Johnson a chance to receive a presidential nomination from his own delegation. For Rayburn, though, this strategy was purely about having a loyal Democratic Party supporting Texas delegation to that convention. And when Rayburn published his thoughts about Johnson leading the delegation, it was correctly interpreted as a direct challenge to Shivers. Johnson ended up leading this delegation, but he also wanted to keep some sort of peace between himself and the conservatives within the Texas delegation. And this angered the liberals in the delegation. So once again, the delegation, no one was happy. Um, and just to reiterate the point, Johnson did not want to fight with Shivers in any way, especially the way Rayburn wanted him to. So as before, uh, Rayburn and Johnson kind of got over these disagreements they had, but being mentor and protege, or even like father and son, never guaranteed that there were peaceful relations between the two of them. Emma, you talked about their differences, but can you tell us if they had any similarities? Well, <clears throat> they actually had a lot in common. Uh, both of them were from Texas, of course, but aside from that, they probably had as much in common as they had differences. Although they came from opposite ends of the state, Rayburn and Johnson had similar upbringings. Um, Lyndon's father, Sam, had tried to earn his living on the family farm before turning to politics and after serving four years in the Texas house, he, Sam returned to farming about the same time that Lyndon Johnson was born. <clears throat> and Rayburn's father, Will, was a farmer in Tennessee and, and moved his family from Tennessee to North Texas in search of better farming land. So both Lyndon Johnson and Sam Rayburn, their families struggled to make their living off the land. Now, the story of their college life is incredibly similar as well. Um, they each attended a teacher's college and they each worked to pay their own way through school. And they both took some time off to earn tuition before returning to school to complete their degrees. And as you can probably guess, since they graduated from teacher's colleges, the both men worked as teachers for a short time while awaiting their chance to enter the world of politics. Interestingly enough, both of them have, have were considered well-liked and inspiring educators. So, you know, <laughs> all of that is the same and with their similar histories. 
where they came from. They, these poor farming rural upbringing. And it, it isn't all that surprising that essentially the Lyndon Johnson and Sam Rayburn had the same vision for what they wanted to achieve once they got to Washington, DC. And that was to improve the lives of the working class. For Rayburn, living through the difficulties of life on a farm made him passionate about issues like flood control and rural electricity. And Johnson's experience teaching poor Mexican students in Southern Texas gave him a lifelong desire to fight poverty in whatever way he could. So I think having so much in common in terms of their backgrounds is what allowed them to overcome their major differences and, and really work so well together. They had an understanding of each other because they basically came from the same place. Johnson and Rayburn were both driven by their past to shape a better future for all people. Most people know that Rayburn was a big supporter of Lyndon Johnson's bid to become the Democratic candidate during the 1960 election. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. When Johnson wanted to make a run to be on the Democratic ticket in 1956, Rayburn supported him, but he really considered it more of like a trial run. When Johnson decided to try again in 1960, Rayburn really believed in his chances because he thought the nation was hungry for new, younger Democratic leadership. And it was no secret that he thought Johnson was the, the strongest candidate out there. What was a secret, however, was really if Johnson wanted to be a candidate or not. As the presidential campaign approached, Johnson wavered on how or when to officially join the race. One minute he would be talking about his prospects and his plans for when he won, and the next he would argue that running for president would damage his ability to lead the Senate. Johnson's opponents, John F. Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey, did not hesitate, however. The two of them followed the campaign trail across the country, making speeches and drumming up support. Johnson decided his best strategy was to stay in Washington and strengthen his congressional relationships. Believing that that would pay off at the national convention, but what Johnson and to some extent Rayburn failed to realize is that most convention delegates come from the local level, not from Congress. By the time Johnson realized his error and officially entered the race, he was incredibly behind Kennedy in terms of political support. As the con convention approached, Johnson's chances were dismal, even with the well-known and well-liked Sam Rayburn by his side. Johnson's last hope was that he himself and Rayburn could delay the nomination long enough for the Kennedy support to fade. However, Kennedy eventually won the nomination by almost 400 votes. Once the presidential candidate was chosen, that's when Ray, Rayburn's real work started. Throughout his campaign, Kennedy had chosen not to declare a preferred running mate, which was really uh, beneficial for Johnson in the long run. And after Kennedy won the nomination, many speculated about whether or not he would choose Johnson, who undoubtedly had the best qualifications. The issue was that many, many in the Kennedy camp really resented the tactics used by the Johnson campaign to delay Kennedy's victory. So when Kennedy personally offered the vice presidential nomination to Johnson, Johnson agreed, but he said that Rayburn would have to prove the decision before he would formally take that. Rayburn was against it at first because he thought it would hurt Johnson's chances in the future but he was reminded that going through the route of the vice presidency first was similar to his own rise through the hierarchy of the House of Representatives and might be the only way Lyndon Johnson would become president. After speaking to Kennedy himself, 
Rayburn gave his approval, explaining that having a Southerner on the ticket was the best chance for a Democratic victory. Rayburn was as present in the presidential campaign as he was for Johnson's nomination. And of course, we all know how it ended. Kennedy and Johnson won. So now we'll open it up for questions from our audience. Please remember to use the Q&A window to submit questions and not the chat feature. So it looks like we have one question so far. Robert Cairo, Cairo wrote that Johnson cultivated and perhaps manipulated both Rayburn and Richard Russell as surrogate daddies to the point that he didn't want them to be around each other as they were both under the impression that his attention to them was singular. Can you comment on this dynamic? Well, <clears throat> I... I can comment on at least the Rayburn side of it. I am I haven't read all of Robert Cairo's biography on Johnson. I have read some of the sections where Cairo talks about the Rayburn and Johnson relationship. And I, I personally feel like Robert Cairo doesn't give enough credit to Sam Rayburn or Lyndon Johnson um, with this idea that Johnson manipulated um Rayburn into thinking that he was someone special in his life um I will say I know Richard Russell was a senator and so um it could be an explanation of he has uh advice coming from a longtime congressman who is a Texan and he has information talking you know information coming from a longtime senator I mean Richard Russell started in the Senate in 1933. So he had been there a long time. And the Senate and the House of Representatives are two different animals in terms of how you process the reelections, things like that. But, and specifically in answer to your question about this dynamic, I'm not sure that if Johnson played them against each other, so they both thought they were singular. But as I said, I do think that Robert Cairo underestimates the integrity of the of these three men and that they would that Johnson would manipulate Rayburn and Russell who he did appreciate as senior congressmen and that either Rayburn or Russell would allow themselves to be manipulated to the point that they would buy into this game now that's my personal take on the Robert K. Rowe explanation um, I can't speak for anyone else on the panel, but that's kind of how I feel about that. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. I don't know if it does. If it doesn't, then please write another one. We can do more research and we can answer it in more links at a different time, unless one of the other panelists also wants to address it. I don't think I know enough about Johnson yet to really... Uh comment on it i really only have one source and you know one so it's fine but you know you really want to consult multiple sources when you try to learn about someone uh, but, but it i mean it's probably just smart of him to get to figures that he can ask questions for but also i, I don't know if it would be like a you, like a sitcom where you have two dates at the same time i, I guess you wouldn't want them speaking seeing you together like that so I, I don't know but I'll definitely look it up not that that question has been asked so thank you for asking that question I think you can also throw Roosevelt in there Johnson cultivated every relationship he could from everything I've seen and took advice piecemeal from them whoever he thought gave him the best advice at the time so I think that he was really looking for support and looking for people to help him along the way and found several so but that he tried to keep them apart I don't know how much of that is because of just him actually forcing that issue and how much is he had one who's in the senate and one who's in the house and one who's in the white house so Okay, 
Looks like we have another one. Uh, can you elaborate about the teaching experiences of both in their younger days? I can take this one if you like. Um, Rayburn really, his teaching experiences were more in North Texas area where he was from. And that helped him a lot because most of those were in his district but also they were small schools. I uh, think the biggest school he taught at had three teachers. So whereas Johnson's first teaching experience was in a really small school, but as he um, progressed, he took on roles in bigger schools and eventually in a high school in Houston, from my understanding. So he had a wider range of students, but they all loved him. Everything I've read, everybody just adored him that he taught. Well, and I have also read that um, we mentioned that he had to take time off from college to earn tuition. And part of the way that he earned that tuition was teaching in small rural communities, um, Mexican students um, that we, we mentioned that. And that's part of those, some of those small jobs in those poor rural communities is how he earned some of his tuition money so that he could go back to school to finish his degree. Can you comment on how LBJ's emergence as a powerful Texas politician contributed to factionalism in the Texas Democratic Party? and subsequent emergence of Texas Republicans. I can take at least a portion of this. <clears throat> um, I think, I'm not sure that LBJ's emergence as a politician contributed to the factionalism. The factionalism was already there. Um, it was really a disagreement about Texas politicians serving in Washington versus Texas state politicians. Um, so really kind of the congressional de delegation that was serving in Washington, um, a lot of the major leaders of the Texas de delegation there disagreed with some of the actions of state leadership and specifically Alan Shivers. Um, and that Alan Shivers was dividing the Texas Democratic Party. Um, and it sort of was at a time when the country was divided. Um, people were either very conservative or very liberal. And the Texas Democratic Party had the same problem. They had disagreements over, do we hold to the way of the way we've always done things, these are our conservative ideas and we're gonna to hold to them versus those who saw that in order for the De Texas Democrats to continue to hold positions of power in state government that they needed to be able to bend and, and change with the times and alter their ideas and realize that you can't have the same ideas that you did a hundred years ago and still be successful. And so Alan Shivers was very, very successful in creating a division within the Texas Democratic Party. Um, now, and that division, I think, is what contributed to the emergence of Texas Republicans. Um, when, when Alan Shivers felt like he was, I don't want to say targeted in the 50s, but he, uh, when Eisenhower, when Dwight D. Eisenhower chose to run for president the first time, Alan Shivers uh, backed him. So he backed this, you know, the Texas governor who was, you know, supposed to be backing our Democratic candidates, which at the time was Adelaide Stevenson, instead chose to back the Republican candidate. And it furthered that divide in the Texas Democratic Party because you now you have a large contingent of people who support Alan Shivers and so therefore are supporting the candidate that Alan Shivers supports. And I believe both times Eisenhower ran for president, then Texas, he, he got the uh, vote in Texas. Uh, of, of course, he has Texas roots, but he was a Republican. And up until that point, 
Texas had primarily been Democratic. And so I really think the tide started to turn with the Eisenhower administration. And at the same time, there was the Tidelands question, which was another sticking point between congressional Texans and state Texans over the question of um, the ownership of Tidelands and how that whole worked. And so all of that together kind of contributed to this ongoing factionalism. And when there are, when your own party can't come together and agree, then the party that can tends to take over. But uh, that's my two cents on that. But again, I will leave it open to the other panelists if they want to add. Uh, I'll just say, I think Truman had some quote where he said something about wishing that some Southern Democrats would just go ahead and admit they were Republican already. Uh, so I think everywhere in the South, you know, that split uh, was especially going to eventually happen. But even in the 30s with the New Deal, um, Rayburn, Sam Rayburn's mentor, John Nance Garner, really split with Roosevelt on the New Deal policies. And there's uh, something in the, the Caro book about uh, like Johnson and his his the congressman he worked for Kleberg and some others who you know publicly went with it but privately totally disagreed with a lot of the things it did. So I, I kind of feel like that factionalism was always there. I, I, I mean, I'm, it was going to happen sometime. But again, I, I need to read up more on Johnson and see. But I I don't really know if not that the, if that's not what you're implying or anything but that you know one person could finally break the party i think it was just a long time coming and you know the democratic the democrat and republican parties had their ch platforms and everything has changed so much over the years and then the 80s i guess is how it kind of got like it is now so uh it's it was a long time coming it would i think i think well, and Johnson was really good at playing everything close to his best and not necessarily letting everybody know his feelings on everything. He might even vote one way because that's the way he felt that his constituents wanted him to vote. I know he ran on this Roosevelt platform, but it's later said that he didn't necessarily support the New Deal at the same time. So there's a lot of questions about that too. We have any other questions from anyone? I know sometimes it takes a while for people to type them in, so we'll give you another minute. But I'll let you know that this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Sam Rayburn House website, which is www.visitsamrayburnhouse.com. We'll also include answers to any questions that you want to send in to us. So I'll put our email addresses up on the screen now so you can see them and write them down. If you can come up with anything after we close out here, you can email those to us and we'll include those answers on that blog post that goes along with the webinar. Um, we want to thank you again for joining us today and we hope you have a great afternoon.